You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hi, Cyberwire listeners. This is Luke Vanderlinden, host of the Retail and Hospitality ISAC podcast. We're very excited to announce that our show is joining the Cyberwire Podcast Network. Join me every second and fourth Wednesday for chats with members of the InfoSec community to discuss the latest challenges, opportunities, and best practices unique to cybersecurity in the retail and hospitality industry. Check it out at thecyberwire.com slash RHISAC. That's thecyberwire.com slash RHISAC. And be sure to subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Funding for this episode is made possible in part by Black Kite. Drama and high stakes aren't just for the movies. Risk and Reels is a brand new podcast hosted by Black Kite's very own Jeffrey Wheatman, former Gartner analyst and cyber risk expert. Jeffrey and his industry friends chat about the trials, tribulations, and plot twists of movies and modern-day cybersecurity. The first three episodes are live now, featuring topics like hackers in real life and in the movies, breaking the status quo, and people-centric processes. Check them out at blackkite.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. CISA adds three entries to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. Hydro Chasma is a new cyber espionage threat actor. IBM claims the biggest effect of cyber attacks in 2022 was extortion. Social network hijacking in the C2C market. A credential theft campaign against data centers. Lockbit claims an attack on a water utility in Portugal. Tim Starks from the Washington Post describes calls to focus on harmonizing cyber regulations. Our guest is Luke Vanderlinden, host of the RHI SAC podcast. And disrupting Mr. Putin's speech online and what the hybrid war suggests about the future of cyber auxiliaries. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. We start off with a quick note from CISA. They've added three entries to their known exploited vulnerabilities catalog covering products from IBM and Mitel. The U.S. federal executive civilian agencies have until March 14th to inspect their systems and, as always, apply updates per vendor instructions. Other users, of course, should consider doing likewise. Entry into CISA's catalog means that the vulnerability is undergoing active exploitation in the wild. Researchers from Symantec wrote this morning about an observed campaign that's probably intended to gather intelligence from shipping companies and medical laboratories in Asia. Symantec is calling it Hydrochasma. The researchers have observed activity from the Hydrochasma threat actor dating back to October of 2022. The threat actor isn't linked to any other known campaigns, and data was not seen to be exfiltrated by researchers. But the tools observed to be in use indicated to the researchers that the goal may be intelligence collection. The industry's hydrochasma prospects appear to be associated with COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, which is an interesting choice of targets. The initial attack vector is a phishing email baited with an attached document. The file name is in the native tongue of the victim's organization and has been seen to represent itself as a freight company qualification document and alternatively as a faux resume. Following the initial lure documents, Fast Reverse Proxy, which researchers describe as a tool that can expose a local server that is sitting behind a NAT or firewall to the Internet, drops a legitimate Microsoft Edge update file, 
that also adds meter preter for remote access. The researchers say Hydrochasma seeks to achieve persistent and stealthy access to victim machines, as well as an effort to escalate privileges and spread laterally across victim networks. IBM has published its X-Force Threat Intelligence Index for 2023, finding that the most common impact of cyber attacks during 2022 was extortion. More than a quarter of attacks IBM observed resulted in attempted extortion. Most of these incidents involved data theft via ransomware or business email compromise attacks. X-Force notes that attackers are finding new ways to turn up the heat in extortion attacks. The researchers also note that the average time to complete a ransomware attack has decreased dramatically over the past several years. In 2019, threat actors would usually spend more than two months setting up their attacks. By 2021, they could achieve their goal in just under four days. The report stresses that misconfigured or vulnerable domain controllers can open the door to ransomware. Bitdefender this morning released a report on Sideload Stealer, and that's Sideload with a 1 instead of an I because... because which they call a global campaign that targets Facebook and YouTube accounts. The payoff for the criminals is interesting and shows the complexity that has come to typify the criminal-to-criminal market. Bitdefender says, Sideload Stealer steals user credentials, emulates human behavior to artificially boost videos and other content engagement, assesses the value of individual accounts, such as identifying corporate social media admins, mines for Beam cryptocurrency, and propagates the malicious link to the user's followers. ReSecurity reports a credential theft campaign in progress against major corporate data centers. The researchers write, based on the observed activity, most probable targets of interest for them remain as follows. Help desk systems, customer service, ticket management, and support portals, devices which may be potentially probed remotely, including but not limited to CCTV equipment, watchdogs, and so on, data center visitors management systems, email accounts belonging to data center IT staff and their customers, remote management and device monitoring systems, and integrated lights out, or ILO, a proprietary embedded server management or similar related technology such as OpenBMC, free IPMI, and iDRAC. It's unclear who's behind the campaign, but Bloomberg reports on the basis of conversations with ReSecurity and some of the affected organizations that the incident has compromised a disturbingly large amount of data. The Lockbit ransomware gang has claimed responsibility for an attack against a water utility in Portugal. The record reports that neither water supply nor wastewater services were affected, but that some customer data may have been exposed. Lockbit has given the utility until March 7th to pay the ransom, at which point the gang says it will release the stolen data. The IT Army of Ukraine claimed credit for briefly, periodically, disrupting online services that carried President Putin's State of the Nation address. The IT Army posted in its Telegram channel, We launched a DDoS attack on channels showing Putin's address to the Federal Assembly. The IT Army is the most prominent representative of Ukrainian hacktivists operating as a cyber auxiliary of Ukraine's intelligence and security services. The Ukrainian government freely acknowledges the support it receives from the IT Army, but both the government and the IT Army deny that the hacktivist organization receives orders directly from the government. The contributions of irregulars, privateers, hacktivists, and auxiliaries of all kinds have made to the cyber phases of Russia's war against Ukraine have been large and publicly prominent. Newsweek is running a lengthy appreciation of lessons the present war holds for the future of cyber auxiliaries like the IT Army. It points out, first, the capabilities that the private sector, both hacktivist volunteers and security companies, brings to the battle in cyberspace. The IT Army seems to have provided a template for the sort of rapid wartime augmentation of cyber capabilities that many in governments and industry have mulled for several years. It also highlights some of the remaining ambiguities and uncertainties such auxiliaries will inevitably bring with them. The IT Army is aware of international humanitarian law, 
and the laws of armed conflict, and says it scrupulously follows them, especially with respect to the norms requiring distinction, that is, proper discrimination of legitimate targets from protected non-combatant targets. It also says it aims at the disruption of the Russian economy insofar as that economy supports the war against Ukraine. Some of the ambiguities surrounding cyber auxiliaries follows directly from the ambiguity inherent in the gray zone that cyber operations tend to occupy. Are cyber operations acts of war when they achieve destructive kinetic effects? Almost certainly. What about wiper attacks? Russia has tried these extensively against Ukraine, as Wired notes, to the extent that they become almost a defining feature of Moscow's cyber campaigns. Possibly. Are they acts of war when they're merely disruptive? Perhaps. What about influence operations? Arguably not, although states like Russia are likely to disagree when they find themselves on the receiving end. In any case, the cyber phases of the present war will undoubtedly clarify the application of international law in cyberspace. Coming up after the break, Tim Starks from The Washington Post describes calls to focus on harmonizing cyber regulations. Our guest is Luke Vanderlinden, host of the RHISAC podcast. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Black Kite. Have you ever felt like sprinkling a few words of wisdom from the Godfather into your cyber strategy? Keep your friends close, but your third-party vendors closer. Or maybe leave the extra budget, take the cannoli. Black Kite's very own Godfather of cyber risk, Jeffrey Wheatman, a former Gartner analyst and cyber risk expert, knows firsthand that security teams day-to-day sometimes contains enough drama to rival the silver screen classics. That's why he's hosting a new podcast powered by Black Kite called Risk and Reels, where he and industry friends chat about all things cinema, cybersecurity, and where they intersect. The first three episodes are live now featuring topics like hackers, real-life ones and ones in the movies, breaking the status quo, and people-centric processes. Check them out at blackkite.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Struggling to keep up with the demands of managing and securing identity in your distributed enterprise IT environment? You're not alone, but don't let it hold you back. With Strata's identity orchestration platform, you can secure all your apps on any cloud with any IDP, so your IT teams will never have to refactor for identity again. Imagine modernizing app identity in minutes instead of months deploying passwordless on any tricky old app, and achieving business resilience with always-on identity, all from one lightweight and flexible platform. Want to see it in action? Share your identity challenge with Strata on a discovery call, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. So don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. You are probably familiar with the concept of the ISAC, Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, member-driven organizations with a mission of information sharing and threat mitigation. Luke Vanderlinden is Vice President of Membership and Marketing at the Retail and Hospitality ISAC and host of the RH ISAC podcast. The RH ISAC is a membership organization. Uh, we've been around for 10 years, about 10 years, um, just under 10 years, actually. Um, and our members are retailers, hospitality companies, really any consumer facing businesses. Uh, and we work with cybersecurity departments and other allied units within these members uh, to provide sharing platforms, uh, to provide opportunities for our members to share cyber threat intelligence, best practices, strategies uh, about how to combat cyber criminals. What are some of the specific challenges that folks in retail and hospitality 
face when it comes to sharing their information? From the standpoint of our members, I think probably legal departments have the uh, biggest issues with um, kind of getting comfortable uh, with their companies and their and their professionals uh, talking with other companies and sharing things that might happen uh, at their own companies. Um, but once that hurdle is over, our members typically really enjoy the collaborative environment uh, and really enjoy being able to uh, understand what their fellow members are going through because chances are either they are going for it going through it right now, went through it, or will be going through it themselves. So, um, you know, it, as we say, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so if, if this is the one area where our members can collaborate, and, and it really, really helps. And how do you do that? What's the, the practical things you put in place to, uh, to make this possible? We have a number of platforms, mostly online, uh, so ways for them to chat instantly with each other, ways to have more um, substantive, meaningful conversations, uh, and also libraries of, of uh, reports and things like that that are either uh, done by our uh, research department or compiled uh, from the conversations that our members are having. And then we also have a bunch of events, both virtual and in-person, uh, where members can either get together with each other and interact face-to-face -face, uh, and collaborate in that platform as well. Um, so it's really, there's a lot of different opportunities if you're someone who likes the written word more versus someone who likes uh, talking versus someone who likes uh, being in person with someone to collaborate. So, so how do you s describe an ISAC to folks who may not be familiar with it? You know, it, that's interesting. So we didn't invent the ISAC model. There's, I, we used to say two dozen, but I keep running into more ISACs and ISAOs and, <laughs> and things that are similar. Uh, so there's at least three dozen and, and growing. And ISAC, ISAC stands for Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Uh, and it's really, originally it was set up, I think during the Clinton era, um, as a way for organizations who might otherwise compete to be able to collaborate on security. And for us, that means cybersecurity. Some organizations, it's it's um, physical security. Um, but it, it, there's enabling legislation, and I can maybe I, I shouldn't be speaking about this because I'm not the, the legal scholar here, but uh, that allows uh, companies that would otherwise not be able to collaborate uh, because of antitrust rules to be able to collaborate on this one thing. Uh, so we, um, when we were founded, we adopted this existing ISAC model and became the ISAC for the sector uh, and um, and so follow the model. And, and there's, there's organizations like the National Association of ISACs for the U.S., uh, the European Council of ISACs is one that we're getting spun up uh, to kind of bring these organizations organizations that are similar to ours together so we can also collaborate with what we do. Well, you all have a podcast uh, for the RHISAC. Tell us about that. What, what information are you hoping to share? Yeah, we uh, we actually started this podcast about a year and a half ago, and we originally started it, it was for members only. Uh, and then we decided, look, we're putting all this effort into getting our members to come and talk on it and, and to kind of curate uh, some content. We might as well make it public, not for the general public, but for cybersecurity professionals in our sector, because we we hoped and thought that that the sector could benefit from it. So about a year ago, uh, we made it public and uh, features are kind of a mixed bag of things from uh, interviews with uh, employees from our core members uh, to uh, what we call our associate members or cybersecurity vendors or professionals uh, that, that serve our, our core members. Uh, we talk about everything from uh, ways to improve cybersecurity programs to challenges, opportunities, best practices to uh, like a member spotlight where we just talk about uh, pulling a member and ask about their career journey and how they got uh, to where they got. Uh, and then we also will feature um, our own employees. And, and you know, I, I like to say, I'm not blowing smoke here, that this is the smartest group of people I ever worked with. Uh, so we can talk about a lot of what they're working on, some of the trends they're seeing, and then some of the events that we have, uh, the reports that we publish, and, and other threat intelligence and things like that. Are there any stories or guests that have stood out to you, th things you'd like to share with our audience? Oh man, there's so many. I, I haven't been the host exclusively until uh, now. So I've been involved in probably only about a quarter of the episodes, but of course I listen to them all. And uh, it's just really fascinating when you hear uh, someone's uh, outlook uh, on everything from security awareness and how the human aspect of, of cybersecurity to uh, some of these, you know, as, as the threat actors themselves evolve, some of the new ways uh, that they're using things like uh, point of sale systems and the physical world to uh, engage in, in cyber threat activity. So uh, really, you know, the, the individual uh, aspects of things, I think the human aspect of, of the stories is great, but also just 
seeing what lengths some of these uh, cyber threat actors will go to, and, and uh, how our our members and the on the people and the good guys have to have to stay on their toes. That's Luke Vanderlinden from the RH ISAC. The Retail and Hospitality ISAC podcast is the newest addition to the CyberWire network, and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And joining me once again is Tim Starks. He is the author of the Cybersecurity 202 at the Washington Post. Tim, it's always great to welcome you back. Um, looking at the 202 this morning uh, and your article about uh, a federal panel uh, saying that uh, we need to be harmonizing our cyber regulations. What's going on here, Tim? Yeah, well, we've seen, and you and I have talked about this a fair amount, uh, we've seen this kind of, uh, not even kind of, an actual proliferation of cyber regulations in the United States. Uh, that's a, that's mm. a, the, the sea change of approach from the Biden administration to to be to push more mandates and say we 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 expect you to do this, not would you please do this, uh, which is what we've what we've had. Uh, so naturally, there's a lot of discussion about how this is rolling out. I mean, you have many agencies rolling out rules. Uh, TSA has rolled out rules, for instance. You have organizations like the SEC and. Uh, you know, FCC who have, who, have, who have rolled out rules or talked about rolling out rules. And there's also a, a patchwork of, of regulations across the, the world. Europe uh, has been doing some things. Australia has been doing some things. Saying we, we expect more from you on the cyber front in terms of what we really need you to do, not just ask you to do. So this particular panel... NSTAC, uh, I just just forgot the acronym, but it's it's a telecommunications oriented panel. National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. I happen to have it in front of me. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being back, backing me up on that and not leaving me hanging. There you uh, go. <laughs> anyway, the uh, the panel is made up of uh, approximately thirty, if not precisely thirty, uh, experts from industry, organizations like Microsoft, Comcast, explicit cybersecurity organizations, and, and their their job is to advise the president on on cyber and, and related issues. In this case, they put out a report that says CISA should, CISA being the Department of Homeland Security's cyber agency, should put out, uh, should create an office specifically devoted toward harmonizing these regulations and making sure that they don't conflict with each other and that they don't cause an undue burden. Um, there are some other mm. recommendations that are related to uh, that process, but I think that's the headline uh, bit, is the, is the idea that this organization thinks that CISA should create its own harmonization office. And why CISA? What makes them the agency of choice to uh, to ride shotgun on this? Yeah, they put a good deal of thought into that. And, and at the at the hearing yesterday, where they where they uh, approved this, there was some discussion: should it be at at, uh, at the office of the national cyber director because it's got the White House nexus, it's got the sort of cross government nexus? Should it be uh, even Commerce Department? And they settled on CISA because well, there are a few reasons. One is that CISA, with one exception, doesn't have any real regulatory authority. So when it's interacting with regulators, it is more in an advisory, uh, technical assistance kind of role. And that's what the, they have in mind for this office. I think that's the main reason, but there were a couple other they also, also talked about. That was the main reason. There's an office that's already kind of doing this, uh, or, or another committee that's kind of doing some of this already. It was specifically created in response to the information sharing Incident response reporting law that Congress passed last year, knowing that this was going to be adding a regulatory rule that to have a committee that, that works that out on a, on a smaller scale. This, this would be a, a little bit more cross, across all sectors. CISA has that, that overall job of protecting critical infrastructure, but they don't have necessarily assigned specific agencies for which I mean, they do have a certain number of agencies for which they're supposed to, where they're the lead, lead sector agency. Uh, but for the most part, that's farmed out to the, the, the particular agencies that, that normally have oversight of those things, energy department, electricity, that kind of thing. Why do you suppose that this committee thinks that uh, CISA not having regulatory power is a feature? Yeah, I, I think they think of it as what's the existing relationship? And if the existing mm -hmm. relationship is they've been serving in that role, then that allows them to continue serving in that role. And one of the things that you hear about CISA from time to time, even Jen Easterly, the director, has said she doesn't want it to be, to be a regulatory agency. You do hear a, a, a fair amount of, of worry that CISA 
particularly from the right side of the, of the spe- political spectrum, might become too regulatory. And, and one of the advantages, the argument goes, of CISA being non-regulatory is that they, they know that when people are going to come to them for help, the, the people who are victims are not going to have to be worried about what this will mean for them from a regulatory standpoint later from if they if, if they've asked for CISA's help. I see. Now, it wasn't just about harmonization here. They had a, a few other suggestions. What other things are they looking for? Yeah, um, they're looking for um, work on uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is a, a big issue. Uh, they want they want mm. CISA and NIST to be prepared for the future of quantum computers where they're going to make it uh, a lot easier to break, break encryption, uh, those computers, when and if they arrive. They want them to go ahead and start planning that, CISA and uh, NIST in particular, to start working on that. Um, they also want to ask, they've also asked CISA and the General Services Administration to come to come up with some, some language for when they are, for the buying and procurement of technology, what, what the government's preferences are on, on, on how secure those be, should be. And another major recommendation was um, there's this program called Continuous Diagnostics and Monitoring that CIS is in charge of that's, that's in kind of, it, well, it's like it sounds. It is continuously being on the lookout for threats to federal agencies, and they want to see that expanded to in, in, incorporate other kinds of threats and essentially make that program more powerful and uh, uh, more, more ready to combat some of the, the modern threats. That's a fairly old program that, that, get, that has gotten updated from time to time, but, but they had a specific uh, things about talking about wanting to use zero trust and, and some of the, these more modern ideas about, about cyber that, that weren't really as prominent as when, when, when CDM was created. So this advisory panel submits their recommendations. What sort of timeline are we on for these being considered and possibly being put into action? Yeah, it certainly it certainly matters how much the the president wants to go along with this. If you look at their the bylaws of the NSTAC, they they say that you know that that once the report is delivered, validated recommendations shall be reviewed by interagency to see who, how they can be carried out. It's not it's not exactly binding. However, I I think one of the things that Gives it a little bit more oomph. First off, it's a it's the president's own panel. Um, he's you know mm. he's, he's turned to the, he's asked these people for advice. I don't think he's going to turn down the majority of it. He might turn down some of it. Um, the other the other thing about the panel is that there was a discussion w- with the ONCD, the National Cyber Director's Office. They have been working on a national strategy that is focused on pushing more regulatory uh, approach to cybersecurity. And the the person who was there, Rob Kanaki, said that this really dovetails with what they had in mind. Some of what is being put forward, I think you can say, has has some real muscle behind it, even if there's no uh, explicit regulatory rulemaking muscle that NSTAC has. All right. Well, Tim Starks is the author of the Cybersecurity 202 at The Washington Post. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Always happy to be here. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Nisos, the managed intelligence company. At Nisos, they help enterprise businesses achieve better risk insights and outcomes by delivering threat intelligence as a managed service. At Nisos, you can rely on their people, process, and technology to help you control costs while improving your defenses. They help you respond to threats faster and more effectively through assessments, monitoring, and investigations. Learn more about Nisos at nisos.com. That's N-I-S-O-S dot com. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is a production of N2K Networks, proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by John Petrick. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.
This episode is made possible in part by RSA Conference, where the world talks security. Through global events and year-round content, RSAC connects you to cybersecurity leaders and cutting-edge ideas for a safer, more secure future. Learn more at rsaconference.com slash cyberwire23.